Then when we get to it, I'll practice the power of pointing, because there's one thing. I'll put it on my palm. Um, so let's see. Um, so I'm going to try and juggle among a few hats I've worn over the years, uh, and, and, and nationalities and citizenships, but work done in Europe, in Israel, in the States, and, and mostly drawn my, on my work in, in, in aesthetic theory and deal with a constellation of concepts around the term new Jewish music and the aesthetics of the new, of novelty. Um, of course, and, and, and actually it's very relevant and very important, Elise, in her remarks earlier, introduced a whole other term that we did not discuss beforehand, which is that of contemporary, uh, which brings a whole bunch of other issues. And I actually have some, but maybe later on in, in, in the retreat, but some insider's uh, uh, view on this. Uh, just a few months ago, the Contemporary Jewish Museum opened in San Francisco. I happened happen to work for the other Jewish museum, the other side of the bay, and it's it's actually a very interesting dynamic there and something probably to be discussed and I think relevant to everything we talk about. But um, a couple of declinations of, of the concept of new and novelty. Um, the first one that I see is you know new as uh, what people or most people at least do not know. And I think we should never underestimate the power of marketing. And the lesson I've, I've been learning, and I keep being amazed by this, by moving to this country, I've been in this country for five years now, but it's never to underestimate the power of renewal in America. It's, a, it's an amazing power, the idea of, of renewing, of reinventing, that over there, let's say, in the old country, we really know nothing about. And I'm serious, it's a, it's a, it's a whole other continent of, of, of uh, feelings, of ideas, of expectations. And uh, I can just give a couple of, of examples uh, uh, about this. Is just the, 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 as in the, the, the idea of what most people do not know. I've been recently exposed to a variety of uses of the term Mizrahi in the Bay Area, where I live. And I can assure you that our concepts of Mizrahi attached to music that have absolutely nothing to do with anything I've ever known about Mizrahi music in, in all of its different manifestations. It's amazing to see how a, a label that, you know, like I feel like I come with a whole luggage, etc., and I, I'm immersed in an environment made of many people, individuals, bands, etc., that, that use this concept in, in ways that have absolutely no connection with what I call reality. And it's, it's an amazing feeling to see what's out there. In general, the idea of what's out there and all these completely unexpected things that keep uh, popping up. Uh, another signal of, of what is not known is uh, another sort of sub-aesthetic category, which is the aesthetic of the trad. Uh, many of the, of the, if you look at the paratext, that all the liner notes and, and all the information on, on CDs of the Jewish music revivals, uh, very often you will have the title of a, of a track on a CD, it's typically CD, and then in parentheses, trad. So it's open in parentheses, T-R-A-D, often period, not always, and then you close your uh, parentheses. And uh, one of the most interesting examples of this was actually a, a dear friend who's a clarinet, Jewish clarinetist in Trieste, Italy, who put out a CD of a, actually fairly good CD in the, in the Klezmer Revival, I would say, very good musicians. And it had one of the tracks that the title was Bulgara La Klezmenatics, and then Trav <laughs> next to it. Uh, it's, uh, it's not funny. It's not funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it, it's actually, it's, it, it carries a lot. Uh, and I think it signifies a whole bunch of things uh, that range from sheer ignorance, lack of research, uh, but also the idea that referring to tradition is, is a mark of pride. And so the incongruity of putting cosmetics and traditional on the same line and re referring to the same uh, to the same piece of music has carries a lot of a lot of weight, I think. Uh, as an aesthetic value, so I move on to a different thing: new. So away from the idea of new as unknown, uncharted. Uh, as an aesthetic value, uh, well, according to aesthetic theory, 
new can be categorized in two areas, very distinct and equally important. One is that the new is a subcategory of the interesting, as categorized by Karl Rosenkranz, the aesthetic of the ugliness, and itself the interesting is a subcategory of the ugly. So it has nothing to do with beauty. So in general, according to aesthetic theory, when we think about new associated to an art form, we're not dealing with beauty at all. It's a, it's a whole other aesthetic uh, sphere. Um, the other way in which the new is categorized in aesthetic theory is as a breakthrough, something that breaks away from, namely, the old. Okay? And in that case, our, our, the origins of this, of, this, uh, of this concept are with the early avant-garde and especially futurism. It's, it's essentially Marinetti who comes up with, with an elaborate aesthetic of the new in this sense. So the idea of breaking away from something. Um, so on the one hand, the ugly, on the, on the other hand, the avant-garde as a, as a military battle against the old. Okay, so the, the new as fighting against the old. It's a war. It's a war. Avant-garde is, is, a, is a military term applied to war. Um, and then there is new as renewed. And uh, there are a couple of, uh, of interesting areas that I think we all need to keep into consideration when we think about all these things. The first one is the connection that was established by Barbara Kirchner, given that I think in, at first. On, on uh, the, the connection between revivalism and uh, necromancy. Is it necromancy? Necromancy. 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 Thank you. Uh, uh, the idea of revivalism and anything that's put on a stage in, 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 in the Jewish music revival is basically anybody, uh, that includes performers, presenters, co presenters, anybody who's there on a stage in a, in a performance, as, essentially as priests of a, of, a, of a new religion that evokes. The dead, and who these dead are is a is a very loaded question. So this it's and, and it's it's a very uh, particular relationship with the past that this kind of renewal uh, brings. Okay, it has a lot to do uh, with uh, with uh, with the Holocaust and with the role of the Holocaust and with the idea of repopulating the Jewish world in a variety of ways. Uh, the other way in which the Holocaust is brought into this uh, whole set of uh, of concepts is. Um, in the relationship, very tight relationship between re revivalism as, as renewal and uh, historical accuracy, the, the issue of documentarism, and there is a very important. If, if you divide the, the you know production of, of Jewish music into classical textual theory categories as text, as text will be the music, and paratext is everything that's written about the music. Uh, in, in in the paratext, there's always a reference to the academic discourse. It's it's a it's a it's a seal. It, there is a and and you know as a as a scholar involved in this, I and I'm sure my colleagues feel the same way. We we get called upon uh, times over and over again to sort of provide some kind of a seal of approval to the work of an artist. And what that means, what the implications are. Well, I think the most important one. There are all kinds of implications. We talk about it, but the most important one is that the academic discourse becomes an aesthetic value. It's part of the pool of aesthetic value. So historical accuracy becomes an aesthetic value. And again, that I think is very tied to, uh, to the issue of, of the, to the present absence of the Holocaust, the idea of, of a way to reconstruct the past in a, in a, in, and, and, and historical truth is, is over present in this uh, discourse. There is also, um, in, in terms of renewal, all the, all the labels of neo and post. And they have to do, as far as I understand, uh, sort of, you know, culture. They have to do with postmodernism, and I just don't talk about it because I have nothing to say about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is uh, something else that's also very important: as it's the the, the idea of, of virtual Ju Jewish culture, of, of the virtual Jewish space. Again, Barbara Fischer, Gimbert, and especially Ruth Gruber, uh, in in her book uh, "Virtually Jewish," but uh, brought. Fourth, even more recently, with the emergence of things like Second Life, there is a whole Jewish world in in uh, Second Life. Which, by the way, I think in Hebrew is it, isn't it Chaim Chodeshim? Second, anybody think of? I think that Second Life in, in, in Israel is called New Life or New Lives. Um, but um, 
there is uh, I, I, everything I learned about about Second Life. I, love, I learned from from a colleague, my database administrator, who's an avid uh, uh, participant, and she showed me a whole Jewish island. There's a Jewish island with a synagogue. There's only one synagogue. It's, it's done by a non-Jew, so probably that's why there's only one synagogue. Um, and, and a Jewish museum, and I think a Holocaust memorial, and, and of course music, and all kinds of other things, and I think there's more going on uh, there. I know we're, we have a panel at AJS coming up on, on this whole thing, on, especially on the impact of Second Life, uh, and uh, Judaism, what, Judaism, Judaism 2.0. Uh, but in, in, in within this, this context, I see the whole issue of virtual Jewish cultural space as a Jewish cultural space that is shared by Jews and non-Jews in equal powers and equal proportions. And what is really important for me there is actually that this reflects also on the cultural products. The cultural products of a virtual Jewish culture are equally shared, equally, parenthetically, between Jews and non-Jews. And um, and this is, uh, this is something I've actually I've been witnessing very recently. I traveled to Italy twice within two weeks in, in September for the Euro European Day of Jewish Culture, which is celebrated throughout Europe. It's like 25 countries. The same day uh, of the month is typically the first Sunday of September. Uh, a host of Jewish sites are open to the public, many of, of which are never populated by Jews during the year. And Italy is particularly active, so it's probably the most active country in this, uh, in this uh, uh, landscape. So there were, I think this year, about 42 sites throughout Italy, from north to south, that were open. So old synagogues, cemeteries, uh, old landmarks of all sorts. And uh, as part of that, I, 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 was, I was part of two distinct musical events that were uh, very interesting. Uh, they were the, the first performances since they were originally performed of, of uh, Hebrew cantatas uh, from the 18th century. They were performed in the same location where, for which they had been composed. So uh, one was in Siena. In Siena we have the whole score and description of the, of the event in, uh, in the fall of 1786. A new synagogue is open and there is a whole musical setting for it with Hebrew poetry composed for the occasion. And the ceremony lasted about four days, and the culmination of the ceremony was on Motse Shabbat, and it was a musical performance with Kabbalistic texts and music, and the music was created by a local non-Jewish composer together with a local Jewish amateur. And um, there were two synagogues before, and the two synagogues merged in the ceremony, so people from each synagogue walked through the streets of the ghetto carrying their old Sifre Kodesh, and, and they brought it into the new space. And the, the audience of the ceremony was, uh, was uh, mixed with Jewish and non-Jewish. The non-Jews, the non-Jewish authorities especially, were invited to, to the ceremony. Uh, very similarly, a few decades before 1733, Casale Monfadato. Um, I have photos if anybody's interested, but it, it's, it's interesting, but it, it's a similar story, Kabbalistic ceremony for Oshan Arabai, or Cantata, composed by a non-Jewish composer. Uh, set to Hebrew text by a local Jewish musical amateur um, amateur musician, and again uh, translations of all the Hebrew text in, in, in Italian. The local non-Jewish authorities brought into the ghetto both times at night, so nocturnal ceremonies under the seal of of Kabbalah of mysticism as a very sexy thing. The idea of going and learning uh, the secrets of the Jews, from the Jews, learning the secrets of, of life and knowledge. Um, and I, the, what, what I'm sharing with you is not, I mean, this is part of it, but what I'm sharing with you is that I found myself in the same places several centuries afterwards in what seemed like the same exact situation. Uh, most of the musicians who were performing were non-Jews, and the audience was split, and all the Jews who normally don't go to synagogue showed up for these kinds of events, but essentially it was a mixed uh, audience, and the feeling was very strong at that point that that uh, that these cultural products uh, were cultural products that were generated in a shared partnership, and I think that a lot of the academic discourse of every most of the things I read about Jewish music, in all the various exceptions that, that Judah is so 
wonderfully explained to us, uh, are about you know the the origins of Jewish musical traditions into non-Jewish music, and as if this was something that happened just I don't know maybe over the internet or something I don't know, uh, with no real contact between Jews and non-Jews, and the feeling I'm getting more and more is that of the need for us to start constructing a new narrative around this, which is a, a narrative of a shared endeavor. So not just but of a, a shared production. And the production of Jewish music, whatever you want to call it, is a shared uh, task. So I think that this is an important concept for, for us to, 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 keep, uh, to keep in mind. I gave out an, a handout, which is, the, in a way, the beginning of what I told you about. This is Salomone Rossi, six, published in 1622 in, in Venice. And if you, if you read Hebrew and you read right before the word Venezia, which is the big word toward the bottom, what you have, you have two words, which is Chadasha uh, Ba'aretz. So this is a, the, the, you know, the, the cover of, of, of Salomon Rossi's foundational work. Foundational of what? I think of what I'm talking to you about, the idea of a shared cultural product, which is presented as new, a new thing in the land. Um, we find a similar, I think, a very similar label in, in, in the seminal a CD by Brave Old World, 1997, I think it was, Blood, Blood Oranges, with the label New Jewish Music, again, as a label on the cover of, of the work. And, and again, I, I think we ought to consider all of this as a shared cultural product, not only was published in Germany, but you know, I think there are a lot of them where Michael here can talk about it, so I don't need to talk about his work. Uh, but I, I think that it's a very, very important piece in this whole uh, landscape. Um, one last uh, remark is that actually I've been talking a lot about new, 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 and various declinations of this concept, uh, but and it also came up in, in, uh, in uh, Judah's remarks. Uh, we also ought to consider the knowledge of the old within Jewish mu musical production, Jewish musical cultures, as an aesthetic value. It seems that that's also part of our uh, constellation of aesthetic values. So the knowledge of the old, so not just the, the validation from academia, but the direct knowledge of, of the old in some ways comes up over and over again as an aesthetic value. It's a way in which we appreciate a musical work of art. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.